Everything about Mars is observed and measured. Olympus Mons, the largest extinct volcano in the solar system, three times the size of Everest. Valles Marineris, the largest canyon in the solar system and as wide as the United States. Orbiting cameras reveal stunning images. Wandering sand dunes, towering dust devils, titanic glaciers, and landscapes like abstract paintings. In the 21st century, the red planet beckons. And nations around the world are lining up to reach it. Four, three, two. India has successfully launched its first Mars probe. The European Space Agency just sent this rocket. And soon after, the first private Mars rocket will be launched by SpaceX. By 2020, it's going to get crowded on Mars. These are the models of China's Mars probe, which are... China is sending an orbiter and lander. In Paris, at the headquarters of the European Space Agency, they're committed to landing and drilling. Mars is something like a magnet for illusions, for visions, as well as the moon was in the past. Mars has also become a destination for national prestige. This will be the first ever Arab Islamic mission to another planet. The Emirates Mars mission will have a major impact and a legacy here in the UAE. But no country is more advanced and determined than the United States. We believe we'll have humans in the vicinity of Mars, hopefully in the early 2030s. So that probably means the first mission, just like with the first Apollo missions, we didn't go right and land on the surface. The first thing we did was orbit. The first phase of the journey to Mars is what we call the Earth-reliant phase. And that really centers around the International Space Station. Give me a minute, I'll work on that. Every day, uh, the astronauts from all around the world up on the space station are doing work to get us ready to send humans to Mars. Things like, how does the human body adapt to space? Today, NASA is already preparing a new generation of astronauts for the challenges of deep space exploration. This is the giant training pool at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. One of the coolest things about this job is that we're doing something different every day. And one day we're flying an airplane. The next day we're in the spacesuit doing a training run in the neutral buoyancy lab. Before joining NASA's astronaut corps, Jessica Mayer was already a distinguished physiologist, studying animals that thrive in extreme environments. She traded in her dive suit for a spacesuit, and she brings her experience to the astronauts who will make the epic journey. Now I'll be a subject for those experiments. So after organizing the experiments, then experimenting upon all these other animals, finally I'm going to become the guinea pig. So I guess it's my turn. We think about the long journey to Mars, the fact that it'll take about six to nine months with today's technology. There are some main areas that we need to be prepared for. And I think one of the principal ones is that of radiation understanding how to protect humans from the radiation dose that they would receive in getting to Mars. NASA engineers are already building Orion, the space capsule that will get them there. We need to make sure that humans can be protected as much as possible from space radiation, those streams of particles coming from the sun. Now, it turns out those particles, while they're moving extremely rapidly, they're still moving slowly enough that we can fairly effectively shield against them, especially with 
extra layers of, of metal. And it turns out water is a potentially effective shielding material. So we sort of know how to protect the astronauts, but we've also been looking at what's the duration astronauts would spend in deep space, what's the likely dose they would get, and how much of a risk is that? How will they live? The round trip journey, including the time on Mars itself, could take up to three years. NASA is experimenting with habitats for the long journey through HERA, or the Human Exploration Research Analog. Lisa Spence is in charge of studying how four astronauts can live in this module without killing each other. You're really looking at a time period of several years for crew members to be only interacting directly with each other. And so we want to make sure that we understand um, how we can best take care of all of the uh, physiological as well as psychological aspects that our crew members are going to go through on those long duration exploration missions. Giving them space is vital. The first floor is the work area. And then the elevator to the second floor takes you to the living area. Up above are four sleeping modules. It's tight, but there are condos in New York that are smaller. On Mars, the astronauts will also need a way to get around the planet's surface. And that's the job of the Space Exploration Vehicle. It's striking the amount of planning, design, and construction that's already going on to get us onto Mars. The strategy on Mars will be to take two of these vehicles and explore with two crew members each in two vehicles. One of these will sustain four crew members. So if you do have one vehicle breakdown, you transfer into the other, and then you go directly back to your base. The space exploration vehicle has two suits. The primary reason for these external suits is to keep the Mars dirt out. And that's from working with the guys on Apollo, all of the crew members that actually walked on the, on the moon, and that they had trouble with lunar dirt inside the cabin. I am working on the suits that we will one day see on Mars, uh, hopefully in the 2030 time frames. But it will be a suit very much like the one standing here next to me. A spacesuit in general is already a complex problem because a spacesuit, you can think of it as a personal spacecraft for one. It has to do everything to keep a person alive and able to work in a very extreme environment for long periods of time. Mars specifically also poses some unique problems. We have to think about how our materials are going to hold up to the radiation environment on Mars for long periods of time. We're used to, with the astronauts and the International Space Station, being close and being able to talk to mission control whenever they have an issue. But for Mars, with the time delay in communications, the astronauts have to be able to do things themselves and they have to be self-sufficient when they're using the suit. So there's a lot of focus on making sure that they can use the space suits without a lot of assistance or a lot of help from flight controllers on the ground. Even if all these projects work, there's one great hurdle, the length of the journey. Chris Hadfield commanded the International Space Station and spent five months in space, almost as long as a one-way journey to Mars. He says, we have to wait for much faster spacecraft. What if someone gets appendicitis? What if we've designed something wrong? What if our power system fails? If the radiation's too high? If uh, we, our food starts spoiling? If, if all sorts of ifs. Toilet stops working, oxygen system stops purifying. We're, we are absolutely beholden to those things. Whereas if you could get to Mars in a few minutes, they wouldn't matter. Five, Despite four, these obstacles three, and getting to Mars, NASA one, is pressing five. on.